Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, he's the uh, author of um, like Treasure Island. I almost said Treasure Planet, but that's the Disney, Disney version of in outer space. Uh, Treasure, you know, Island. Um, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a couple other things like that. Uh, but the Treasure, you know, all, a lot of these writers, you know, write their experiences. He was actually on a boat and it almost sunk uh, one time. And so that was his kind of, you know, fantasy is this, oh man, we could be, you know, end up somewhere where like, wow, we found this mythical island. But they're in this like terrible storm and he and a couple of families were trapped below deck. The captain says, you stay down here. You do not come up. All right. And as they're in there, like the water's starting to fill up, you know, it's like up to their knees. And one of the guys is like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm finding out what's going on. And so he goes, uh, he goes climbing up, uh, on the main deck and it's just a terrible storm and he sees this uh pilot uh the you know the guy that's driving the boat and he's just you know he's just driving there maybe like i kind of picture like lieutenant dan just like Woo! he's just he's having a blast and he sees him and he's like hey he's waving like saluting uh, and so he's like okay he doesn't seem worried to me like he's smiling he's you know saluting me so he goes back downstairs he's like it, i mean it seems scary but Saw the pilot. He's got a smile on his face. I think we're okay. I think we're okay. You know, after a few hours go by, they kind of clear the storm. Captain comes down, and he's like, "Wow, like guys, we there were a couple. We almost went down. This that was the scary. Like, I, I thought we were done for." And they're like, "Whoa, you know, Bill over here. Got, he goes up. He he looks at the pilot. And he kind of gave him the indication that everything's okay. And he's like, "Listen." All of us that knew we were doing were battening down the hatches. We just had anybody just hold on. He's just a crewman just holding on to the, you know, just, we just said just hold on to this, you know, wheel, keep it straight. He's nuts. You know, like, he doesn't know what he's doing. All right, but he took a smiling face, and like, hey, <laughs> living the dream here. He took the smiling face that everything is okay. You know, he felt that, you know, I guess the pilot knows something. I don't know. He knows something that he knows more than the rest of us. And if he's smiling, we must be okay. All right? And this is one of the pieces of comfort and peace that we get from God. All right? With God in our life, God in us, God with us, he knows the end result. All right? He knows the end result of what we're going through. Even in our own human experiences, our own human circumstances, it's as bad as it can be. We know the end of the story. We know what God is ultimately going to do on this earth. He knows what he's ultimately going to do with his believers. And although God is not crazy, he's got that smile on his face. It's like, I see you. It's okay. He's that comforting presence. You know, Amanda and I were joking the other day. I just turned 36. I still feel like, we both still feel like at times that like when something really bad happens, we better find an adult. You know, like... Something really bad's going on, like, who's in charge, right? And you're like, man, I guess I'm in charge. I guess, like, I'm, there's no more adult than me, all right? And there is this thing about when you see someone comforting presence, someone that just looks in charge, someone that just looks like, I know when I do, I did a lot of youth events, and we'd have, like, big, huge events, and, man, we're way behind in what we've got to do to get together. But my goal, I don't know if I always met my goal, but my goal was always just be a calming presence. Hey, yeah, well, let's get that done. Oh, uh, yeah, that should take about four hours. You have about an hour and a half to do it, but you can do it. Sounds good. You know, and just try to be that calming presence. Just be that person. If they look at me, like, should I be freaking out right now? According to Joe, no, I shouldn't be. I like this quote I found from Unknown. He, he says a lot of good stuff. Um, Safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. All right? And when we are in the presence of God, that is the safest place we can be. Uh, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 1. Let me grab my little clicker right here. Uh, Luke chapter 1. And uh, we ju- this is immediately following uh, the announcement of um, to Ma- uh, Gabriel's announcement to Mary that she is going to give birth to a child. And that, hey, why don't you go uh, to, your, to your relative, Elizabeth, in the hill country. She's also gotten some surprising news that, 
even though she's in her 70s, 80s, 90s, she's having a child, she'll protect you. And let me see if I can get this on here. All right. It says, Luke, verse 39, Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. All right, so Elizabeth is some sort of relative of Mary. You know, in some of your translations, it might say cousin. There isn't really a Greek word for cousin. It's just like close relative. So you're basically like there's mom, there's dad, there's brother, there's sister, and then there's just close relative. All right, so she's a relative, mom's side uh, of the family. Uh, she's from a priestly family. On Wednesday, we went through the origin story of John the Baptist. That's what we were doing on Wednesday. We'd love to have you uh, on Wednesday nights, as well as we kind of look at some of the other aspects of the Christmas story that we don't have time to get into here on Sunday morning. Um, and there's one verse I want to make sure we recall, because it'll help make the rest of this make sense. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, he says, uh, talking about John the Baptist will be filled, so John and the woman will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. So this is something out of the ordinary. This is something unique that from the very, very get-go, John is being not only associated with the Holy Spirit, that he is going to have the Holy Spirit with him from conception. While in the womb, he is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, this is, this is unique. Uh, we see in the Old Testament, and I know it's kind of weird to think this way, when we read the Gospels, when we read Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were written during New Testament times, but about Old Testament times. You're like, wait, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Old Testament? Yeah, the, the New Testament, meaning the new covenant in Jesus' blood, begins in Acts. All right, in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2, really. When we see the Holy Spirit come down, this is kind of the mark, the change of the church is born. And so really the stories within Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where Jesus is living on this earth is still kind of this Old Testament covenant. They're still under the Old Covenant. It's describing Old Testament times. All right, And here in the Old Testament, we see the Holy Spirit come upon people for certain works and certain acts. We see the Holy Spirit like come upon Samson before a great battle. We see the Holy Spirit come upon David when he is anointed and he writes these incredible uh, psalms. We see the Holy Spirit come upon uh, these prophets as they preach and teach what God has said to them. So we see the Holy Spirit, he kind of comes and goes, he comes for a purpose. And here we see the Holy Spirit coming upon John from his conception, saying from his very moment of existence, he has a purpose of God. He has something God wants him to accomplish that he cannot accomplish without the Holy Spirit from the very get-go, before he is even born in this world, before we even call him, <coughs> before we'd even give him a birthday. All right, And we learned last week that Jesus is God the Son from conception, right? From the very go, from the very get-go, that Jesus is God the Son. He will be the Son of the Most High. We get this declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. And now we learn that John, John the Baptist here, eventually will be known as, that John is starting out his life with the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of connection there. Like, I want to say that he is a type of Holy Spirit. And that maybe is just a little bit of a loaded word. In a, all throughout the Old Testament, we see types of Christ, and there's some really specific mentions, especially in the New Testament, that we reference back to events in the Old Testament as a type of Christ. We look as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Whoever looked at that would be healed as a type of Christ. We, we look at uh, lots of different you know, examples and stories uh, in Scripture as types of Christ, basically a foreshadow of what Christ is going to do. And, and although, again, I don't like to go beyond what Scripture really says. I have no problem saying that John seems to be exemplifying many of the roles of the Holy Spirit. He seems to be a, a living, breathing example that we can see of how the Holy Spirit is going to continue to operate in our life. And we see, just, we see four things here in this very short passage. Uh, we see that he is comfort- he is hype, and now Nathan hates that word. He says, you should be using the word joy or excitement. 
It's like, I thought hype was a more fun word. Uh, but it's like the idea of he, he brings excitement, he brings joy, or hype. Um, he brings truth. He brings, he identifies the truth of things and ultimately brings things to our remembrance. And here in this uh, very first passage, when we look at comfort, we see that Mary needs Elizabeth. We see that he needs her. We talked about this a little bit last week, that uh, what did Mary need the most at this moment, at this time? She needed someone that would believe her, someone that would help her. She's this 14-year-old girl. She's pregnant. No one's going to believe that she didn't sleep with her fiancé, Joseph. The only person that wouldn't think that he slept, she slept with Joseph is Joseph that knows he didn't sleep with her. All right, and so she's got like no ally in her little town. And so her, fortunately, her getting to move a couple miles away into the hill country uh, of Judah, she's got this advocate, someone that met the same angel she met, that gave the same kind of promise that was given to her, that will believe her, an older lady that would help her and guide her and is going through the same thing just kind of six months ahead of her like what you're about to experience is this uh it's horrible uh, but it ends all right we see in john chapter 14 and verse 16 we see the role that the holy spirit plays even just his name they call him the paraclete or the comforter the counselor the advocate it says i will ask the father and he will give you another comforter to help you and be with you forever all right, that the Holy Spirit's role is to be a comforter in our life. And here we see that John the Baptist, and John the Baptist's mom here, in specific Elizabeth, gets to play this role of comforter for Jesus and Mary, his mother. Mary has a place where she is believed and she is safe and she is cared for. We see this principle throughout Scripture um, that God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You know, when God's doing a little, a little something extra, and it's hard to deny that what Mary's going through, a little something extra. That's a little extra. That's a little more than normal. That he's going to provide what you need to make it through that. If he's bringing you to something, He's going to give you whatever you need to bring you through it. All right, and this, we can reverse engineer this too. When we reverse engineer this and we think to ourselves, man, if this is what God is going to have me do, I need dot, dot, dot. I need to have this. I'm going to need more money. I'm going to need more support. I'm going to need a new job. I'm going to need a new place to live. When we reverse engineer this, well, actually, if God is calling me to this and he's not providing this, it must mean I don't need it. It must mean, I might think I need it. I might think it would actually be easier to go through it with this. But if God isn't providing something, it must mean I don't need it because he provides all that I need according to the riches of glory. And even when our head starts to tell us like, I'm going to need more money. Apparently I don't. Because if I really needed it, God would have provided it. God's going to provide what we need. He might be wanting us to learn to trust in him. And God is saying, like, all you need is me for this one. All you need. And he could have told Mary, listen, you're, you're going to be ridiculed, you're going to be attacked, and all you need is me. All right? And yet in this circumstance, he says, I'm going to provide for you a little something extra as well. This is a little, little more difficult. You're not quite ready to trust me in this way yet. There are going to be times, there are going to be times in the future that Mary is going to face alone, that Mary and Joseph get pulled away alone to deal with some of these future issues. And at least from the get-go, at least right off the bat, she learned that God provides, that God protects, that God comforts. And when I face the next challenge... God's going to provide all that I need. Now, when Mary enters the door, and when Elizabeth heard, oh, I, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, 
the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? Hype. That little, that little baby, all right, just leaped for joy. In Romans 15, 13, we read, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We see there's like an overflow here. All right, there's an overflow of the Holy Spirit. When the baby, which we've already saw back in verse 15, is filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus walks in the room, and by walks, I mean, he's letting his mom do all the work. All right? He comes in the room, and the baby leaps for joy in the womb. And Elizabeth gets the overflow of the Holy Spirit, and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a, there's a couple interesting takeaways from this. I think I have it here. There's a couple interesting takeaways. Number one, what we see from this little baby in the womb is he has a soul. Okay? He has a soul. If there's any question about whether unborn babies have little tiny baby souls, all right, the story in Luke chapter 1 with Jesus and John the Baptist, the way that the angels talk about those little unborn babies is that these are they are filled with the holy spirit that this is uh that they are son this is the son of the most high that this is god almighty that he is going to be filled with the holy spirit all right they describe these un newly conceived children as having souls the same way any person any human being has a soul the second thing we see he has emotions that he has emotions every which way that we can identify him as a person there's a body body mind soul spirit all right we see him have emotions that he leaps with joy and then ultimately we get a little insight on the holy spirit we see that the holy spirit is always geeking out over the son of god anytime the holy spirit seems to be anywhere near the Son of God, God the Son, Jesus Christ. There's always like a little, there's a little extra going on. There's always a little something amazing. The Holy Spirit descending like a dove, a leap for joy. There is, uh, the Holy Spirit is always pointing to, always announcing the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And we'll see that uh, more clearly here in just a moment. All right, in Luke chapter 1, verse 42, all right, we see that she cried out with a loud voice. This is like causes the leaping in her stomach. I, I can't imagine. You know, anytime I see like a pregnant woman, like, oh, it's moving, it's moving. Like whatever that leap is, boom, it caused her to kind of cry out in a loud voice. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how is it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me. This reminds me, uh, the same way that Elizabeth is talking about Mary and her little unborn baby Jesus, is the same way that Elizabeth's son John seems to talk about his cousin, or whatever we want to call him, Jesus. All right, and, uh, there's a couple passages I could turn to, but it's just one here in John chapter 1. The, the accounts of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus are in all four Gospels. Um, John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he starts saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he on whom behalf I have said, After me a man comes who is a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I love this. There's not only this announcement, this proclamation of truth, of behold, the Lamb of God. It seems very similar to the way his mom, you know, announces him, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And I, I love his little exclamation. He's of a higher rank than I, that he is something beyond me. I'm, I'm a prophet. Everyone is now recognized as this part of the story. Everyone recognizes John as the next great prophet of Israel. And he's saying, this guy's of a higher rank than me. He existed before me. We 
we learn throughout Luke chapter 1 that John the Baptist is about six months older than Jesus. All right, when we take chronological human years, we see that, yeah, I mean, Jesus, the Son of God becoming a human being, yeah, it's about six months after John is conceived. All right, what he is saying is something very profound, that the Son of God has always existed. It's in the same way when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham existed, I existed. So if they didn't understand, like, wait, maybe maybe Jesus was like a little tiny preemie. Maybe he was like a little preemie baby. All right, and somehow he was born before John the Baptist. He's like, well, I was older than Abraham, so try to figure out that one. It's because the Son of God has eternally existed. He is pre-existence. There was never a moment in which the Son of God was created. There wasn't a moment in which now God the Father says, now I'm making God the Son. All right, He is begotten, not made. And when we use that term, it's just saying He has always existed. All right, The Son of God has always existed. Yes, there was a time right around, probably about 4 BC, but right around the the turn of the calendar, where the Son of God became a human being. And that's where we would now use the term Jesus, being his human name. All right, But we have noticed all throughout the Old Testament these pre-incarnate Christ, the Son of God who kind of intersected time and space to bring words and announcements to the people of God. The Son of God has always existed in John the Baptist here kind of advocates for that. We also understand that this is the role that the Holy Spirit takes in our life, that he is a proclaimer of truth. When the advocate or the counselor or the comforter, whatever term you like to use there, it's this Greek word called paraclete, all right? When the comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. All right, that the Holy Spirit's job in this world is to point people to Jesus, to testify to the truth about Jesus. He is the spirit of truth. He is the one that guides us to the understanding of who Jesus really is. He is the spirit of truth. And he takes that, that's what he is doing here in this world. He is convicting people of sin. He is pointing them to their need for a Savior. And he is pointing them specifically to Jesus because he always geeks out over that guy. In Luke chapter 1, verse 44, we're right here at the end of our passage. In Luke 1, 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears... The baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. By the Lord. We see that Jesus, uh, or should we see that the Holy Spirit, this advocate that we have, this comforter that we have, is designed to bring things to our remembrance. The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. And we see from this point forward, John the Baptist in his ministry, especially when Jesus comes, his ministry shifts, he stops. He's no longer that voice crying out in the wilderness. He now pulls back and everything is just telling people what Jesus has said. That was his role reminding people of what Jesus had said. This is what the Holy Spirit gets to continue to do in our life. Remind us of the truths that we know. When I think of worship, when I think of why do we gather on Sunday, why do we sing songs, the songs that we're singing should just be remembering either who God is, who Christ is, or what God, what Christ has done. We're reminding ourselves of who he is or reminding ourselves of what he has done. And we see the need of human beings to constantly be reminded. The one thing I've noticed in my old age now, and it started like a year, year and a half ago, I can't remember things the way I used to. I used to say things like, 
I'll remember that. I don't need to write it down. I don't need to keep a calendar. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. I can't remember. I have to put everything in my calendar. When you look at my calendar, you just like when you look at the page, just little dots all over, and I have to click on the date to be able to see. It's just like dots everywhere, different colored dots for different calendars. All right? I got dots everywhere because I can't remember things I'm supposed to do. I just obey my calendar. When it comes up and I say, it says the grade, my, grade homework. I'll do it. All right? I just obey the calendar. I just obey what it tells you to say because I can't remember it anymore. The Holy Spirit, God knows the forgetfulness of human beings that we need constant reminders. I think that's the value of having a time, like a Christmas time. The, the, the Old Testament, the Jewish believers were filled with different festivals and different celebrations that they'd have throughout the years to remind them of major events. You know, in really in Christianity, we really have two big ones. We have some little smaller ones, but we have Christmas and Easter. We have events that remind us of what it is, who it is that Christ is, and what it is that Christ has done for us. Um, I love this, uh, another quote, and I, I love it for two reasons. A, I think it's a great quote. B, it, Nathan's kind of final lines of his little mini sermon are the same of the final lines of my sermon here. The peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble, but is rather the confidence that he is there with you always. Uh, and before I go into kind of my little conclusion, kind of be able to tie all these things together, here's a, a great little overview of what the Holy Spirit has done throughout Scripture. The Bible Project people put this together. I always think they do such a great job. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place, but then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you gotta clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's Spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's Spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's Spirit is at work. 
The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. When we think about what the Holy Spirit does in our life, was doing through John the Baptist, and now he wants to continue to live that out through us. Number one is comfort. We see from the very get-go, Elizabeth providing comfort for Mary. We even just see John the Baptist's role of bringing people to the truth, calling a, a, a baptism of repentance. He's bringing, he's building crowds for Jesus's message ahead of time. He's bringing comfort in the same way that the Holy Spirit comforts us with that. It's going to be okay. I have hope. God knows my future. He has plans and purposes for me. He, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So we are comforted. We can then in turn comfort others. And we see from the role here, even though God is all powerful, God is capable of all things, he wants his followers and people to comfort one another. When we see, especially other believers, but all people in general, when we see other people going through a difficult time, perhaps it is us that God is calling to bring comfort there in that situation. So we are comforted, therefore we comfort. And we've seen, even from the very get-go, the comfort that John's mom is giving to Jesus' mom. We, we see hype, or Nathan, excitement, or joy. Um, when Jesus, all he does is enter a room, John the Baptist goes nuts. All right? Goes nuts. Kicking through the spine of his mother. All right? When, G when we see Jesus do anything, we should be even more excited than John the Baptist. All Jesus did was walk in the room. Jesus enters the room, and he goes nuts. When we see God do miraculous, when we pray for healing, when we pray for uh, uh, whatever the specific thing might be, and God answers that prayer, that should be something that gives us excitement. We should be pointing it out. We recognize that unbelievers, other people, don't often see God. They can't see God at work. And it's our role to be able to point out what no one else can see. No one else understood that Mary was the mother of God. Maybe a term that we don't tend to use very much in our Protestant circles that their Catholic friends have used a little bit more often. But Mary is the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. Uh, and so they recognize that. Elizabeth, John recognized that. No one else could see the miracle that was going on. And many times we have to point out, we have to proclaim, we have to talk about who Jesus is because they can't see him for what he is. They needed John to point out and say, there he is. Behold, the man of God who can take away the sins of the world. They wouldn't have been able to recognize that. That's what we get to do, and we get to do it with excitement. God has left us here on this earth to proclaim the good things that God is doing in our life. We can point out, there's oftentimes I'll talk to people and I'll hear the things going out in our life, and I can see like, hey, don't you see how God perhaps orchestrated that? Do you not see perhaps how God ordain this to happen like all the possibilities that could have happened this is what happens can we see god working in that i get to point that out i get to proclaim that i get to be excited about that i get to be joyous about that truth the the, the from the very get-go <coughs> we see that john the baptist's role is to point out the truth 
of who Jesus is. And that is what the Holy Spirit continues to do in our life, helps us to discern truth. It's really difficult. We live in a really difficult age where things that maybe even society had once deemed as true is now deemed as a lie. There are all sorts of things. I, I think about the world that my kids are growing up in that I, I feel like I'm like, man, I got to sit down with them and talk to them about some basic things of like biology and what a boy is and what a girl is. Like, I feel like I have to teach some basic truths. And this is no more true. This is even more true with anything spiritual. All right, we are in a, a, a world where the, it's not necessarily anti-spirituality. All right, there is certainly some of that. There is certainly some just pure naturalism, anti-anything spiritual. But a lot of the, the society we live in is much more of just a pluralistic society, a universalist society. One that says, listen, all paths lead to God. We're at the bottom of the mountain. And, uh, you know, God's at the top of the mountain. And whether you go up the, you know, the church path, or you go up the Islam path, or you go up the Mormon path, or you go up the you know universalist path, or you go up the I just made up my own path, all right? That all paths lead to the top, and there's God at the summit welcoming all his children. Uh, that's not the picture that Scripture brings. He brings two different pictures that are very similar to that. One that he says, wide is the path that leads to destruction. And a lot of people head down that path. A lot of different people with a lot of different kinds of beliefs head down this wide path. And very narrow is the path that leads to life. But the other illustration that he gives is that God is at the top of the mountain, sure. And he saw all humanity walking blindfolded in the destruction. And so God sent his one and only son down from the mountain, down to earth with us. And Jesus came down to earth and we killed him, put him on a cross. He died, rose again, and says, whoever believes and trusts in me, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, I will take you to heaven when you die, if we are connected together, if we are in fellowship. So sure, God's at the top of the mountain and no one can get to the top. I don't care. Nope. Going to church you know, calling yourself a Christian, that don't get you to the top of the mountain. No one can get to the mountain. There is a chasm. There is a, a break that makes it impossible. We're, you know, we think that he's on top. We get there and we realize, oh man, he's on another whole mountain over here. We have no way of bridging that gap. Jesus came down to bring us there. So this is the truth. And we have to help. We need a truth to discern in our own life. And then we get to help discern the truth to other people and God expects us to be proclaimers of truth all right that we have to tell people who it is that Jesus is because he's going to be lied about and his teachings are going to be lied about we have to be vocal in telling people the truth and there is no better time than Christmas time uh, I read this great little story online it's going around Facebook so you might see it I was like for a little boy. Uh, if it's on the internet, it has to be true, right, Mom? Um, this little boy goes to his dad. He's like nine or t you know, eight or nine years old. And he's like, hey, Dad, we need to talk about Santa. All right? All right. Spoiler alert, no kick and go. We got to talk about Santa. And he's like, okay, son, I'm listening. Santa's not real, is he? And he's like, well, son, do you want me to tell you the truth? Well, yeah. He's like, listen, this is the problem with truth. Once I tell you, you, you can't undo, you can't unring that bell. You can't undo, like once I tell you, <laughs> you, you know, all right? You're in on the secret. You can't unknow that. You ready? He's like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm ready. So what's your question? So is Santa real? His dad says, yeah. Oh, wow, I, was, I thought it was going to go a different way, Dad. <laughs> he's like, yeah, Santa's real. Uh, no, he, he's not. If you're picturing, like, an old man, you know, a little, little extra jolly, he eats about, you know, six billion cookies once a year. That's a lot of cookies. You just spread that out over the 
three hundred sixty five days. You know, you know, old man, white beard. He says, "Yeah, no, there's not that." That's not, that's, not that. uh, that's just what we, they people tell kids, you know, because they can understand that. That's that's something they can understand. Because I'll tell you what Santa is. You know, when you open Christmas presents and you don't know who it's from, and you're excited, you have just this like your joy that your face just lights up. And you're so excited to get that. I don't need credit for that. I'm like, I'm reading that, and I'm like, I kind of like that. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, I don't need credit for that. I'm happy that you're happy. Remember the other day when I was on the train that uh, that lady started choking, and I called 911, and I stayed with her until, you know, help got there, and they were able to take care of her and take her away when other people were kind of just stepping over her to get away. She's like, she doesn't know who I am. She doesn't know my name. I got to play the role of Santa Claus. He says, this is the secret. Now that you know that there isn't like just a person that's Santa Claus, it means you have to be Santa Claus in people's lives. You have to be kind to people without people knowing where that kindness came from. Right? He says, that's, that's the big secret that we're not telling anybody. Now that you know, you have to live that out. And I'm like, all right, I can get on board with that. I like that. All right, St. Nicholas is a real person. All right, this this kind of little spirit. I, I like that. He's real. Here's the truth. Here's the truth that Jesus wants us to bring the good news about him to everyone here on this earth. He doesn't, it's not about us getting credit. It's not about us you know, getting famous or well-known or anything from that. We, we don't, we're not looking for any kind of earthly reward, any kind of earthly benefit. The truth is we either care about people enough for them to know the truth of Jesus Christ, how they too can have eternal life, or we can't really say that we love people. And the last thing is remembrance. Remembrance. That the Holy Spirit's role is to help us remember the things. You know, I always kind of say when I'm, when I'm talking to someone and getting an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, it's always that kind of scary moment. There's always that moment of, am I about to start sharing with them the gospel? And it always seems kind of scary for some reason at the onset. And maybe you have those same feelings and thoughts too when you, like you see this little opening, they ask some kind of question that gets you to say like, oh, I think I can talk to them about Jesus right now or I'm talking about church or I'm talking about God. And you're like scared. You get that little sweat like right around the edges here, you know, kind of everywhere. And you're like, am I going to say something? And you, the hardest thing is right when you start, then it's easy. And right when I start, I, it's, it's no problem. It's effortless. It's got to start. It's scary before I start. And once I start talking, I, I also feel after the end of the conversation, I walk away, there is sometimes those things that I'm like, oh, man, I should have said this. I should have said that to them when I was talking to them. I get that feeling, but then I have to remind myself, like, no, no, no. I remembered everything I needed to for that conversation, that God wasn't going to let the fate of, you know, this person's soul come down to my own human memory, all right? If God really needed me to say something, that would have popped in my head and I would have remembered it when I needed it. I apparently didn't need that, or I would have remembered it three minutes ago when I was talking to them instead of three minutes later, all right? God is going to bring to our members, this is what we can know going into any conversation, God will bring to our remembrance any little illustration, any little Bible verse, any little word. You know, even you're like, I can't remember the reference. Unsaved people don't care, don't even know what Romans 15, 14 means. That means nothing. All right? The Bible says, oh, cool. All right? We can, God is going to bring to our remembrance anything we might need. Let's close in prayer together. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit in our life. This, this energy, this power that you have given us, your very presence, your very spirit with us all the time to comfort us, to bring us joy and excitement, to bring us, to help us discern the truth, to help, help us remember what it is of you, who you truly are and what you have done, God. Jesus, I pray 
that we are using the Holy Spirit that you've given us in our life, that we are using your life-giving Spirit in every moment of the day that we are yielded to, that we are uh, in tune with what you want us to do, God, who you want us to talk to, who you want us to interact with, how you want us to talk, when you want us to talk, that we are just in tune with that, God, that we can exemplify the things we see in John the Baptist's life, that we can be a messenger here on this earth for the greatest message of all time, the most important thing in the world, that you, Jesus, came, born as a human being, lived the perfect life, the end of your life, the only person who didn't, choose, uh, didn't deserve to die chose to die. And that you rose from the dead, beating sin and beating death, and awaits back in heaven, ready to prepare a place for anyone who believes and trusts in you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name.